from Global, leading Britain's conversation, Cross Question, with Ian Dale. Hello, a very good evening. It's one minute past eight on LBC. I'm Ian Dale. Welcome to Tuesday's edition of Cross Question. Now, joining me on our panel today, Anne Longfield, who's chair of the Commission on Young Lives and the former Children's Commissioner for England. Uh, William Clouston is leader of the SDP. Lord Charlie Faulkner, Labour peer and former Cabinet Minister. And Janet Daly, political columnist for the Sunday Telegraph. They're looking forward to your questions. 0345 6060 973. And you can watch us on Global Player. Call 0345 6060 973. Tweet at LBC. Text 84850. Cross question with Ian Dale. This is LBC. Well, welcome to you all. Let's go to our first caller. It's James in Chester. Hello, James. What would you like to Hi, ask? Hi, good evening. Uh, I would like to ask if uh, Caressa Dick and Boris Johnson should remain in their respective roles because. You've got Caressa Dick, who is clearly not investigating clear law-breaking, and then you've got a Prime Minister that can't even remember whether he was at a party or not. And so clearly, you know what I mean, we need somebody of some substance to, to you know what I mean, to get us through what we need to get to get through. And well, we, we, quite clearly, we should... Boris Johnson is not the person. We should clarify that the Metropolitan Police have said late last night that they are in touch with the Cabinet Office over the allegations regarding this party, so they haven't said that they're not going to investigate it. You're right, they did say that they wouldn't investigate the first allegation, what was it, two or three weeks before Christmas. Um, William Cluston, let's come to you first, leader of the SDP. Now, um, for people who didn't realise that the SDP still existed, I think you should introduce the SDP before uh, we hear from you on Boris Johnson and Cressida Dick. Well, thanks, Ian. But actually, those in the political universe probably do know we're around. I mean, we've we put a few candidates up at the last general election, and we'll have more in the next general election. And we fought the London mayoral election, and we did pretty well today. We just uh, this last year, we've had a very good conference in November. So yes, the SDP didn't die; it's still here, and we're rebuilding it. Um, in answer to the question, uh, I think I don't think the caller will be disappointed because. Uh, Boris Johnson as Prime Minister is not long of this world. Um, premierships are a bit like holidays. They end before they're finished. And, and I, I think he's toast. Um, obviously, we don't know what actually happened. But the email itself is complete ineptitude. Inviting 100 colleagues to bring their own booze for a get-together during a lockdown is completely inept. I think one of the things that it illustrates... Yeah, but bit, to be fair, he didn't send out that email. We, we don't know yet whether he even knew about it. Obviously, he went to the party. Well, we think he went to the party. That There are witnesses to say that he did. But to say he's toast and then just say in the next sentence, but we don't know what happened. Is that, well, is that no, really a tenable no, I, position? Well, the, the, it's more a question of what's happening to him, Ian, because what's happening is the circle of trust that he had is breaking down, which often happens at late stage, stage premierships. And it's a bit like the photograph from the window for the other get-together in Downing Street. It's just gone. I mean, I, I mean the, the sad thing, actually, apart from anything else, is that we're talking about parties, but they're actually very serious failures that this government is responsible for. It hasn't got a coherent post-Brexit strategy, hasn't got an industrial strategy, doesn't know what it's doing on trade, on housing it's completely useless, you've got an energy crisis... Uh, so their privatisation programme is, is in a mess as well. So things are a mess. I mean, I'm just saying, Ian, I don't think he's going to last much longer. I think that the trouble is that we, with the size of the majority, the public won't put up with the general election soon. So I think we know when the general election will be. It'll be either May 2023 or autumn 2023 or a year later, both. And so I, probably the, the intelligent Tories will be just waiting and, and, and we'll allow, we'll probably keep him in for a, a while for him to take some of the chop this year and then get rid of him next year. Um, Charlie Faulkner, I, I'm trying to think of similar situations that have occurred in previous times, but I'm, I'm not sure that there's one that's been analogous to the, this. Do you share William's view that Boris Johnson, Johnson isn't long for this political world? I don't know how long he will last. I assume that will depend upon an interaction between Conservative members of Parliament and Boris Johnson. All I can say is what I think should 
happen. Uh, Boris Johnson's breezy style and his inability to comply with the rules and his casual relationship with the truth, far from being a problem for him, had for quite a considerable time made him appear a more authentic politician than other politicians. People liked the fact that he didn't appear to play by the over-standard rules that all the more vanilla politicians did. What's being revealed now that his inability to comply with the rules reflected an utter contempt both for the rules and the people he leads. He is the head of the British government. The British government has been leading or trying to lead the country through the worst crisis it's faced for a very, very long time. Part of getting through that crisis has been complying with these special rules that were, and I agree with these special rules generally, that the, that the country has uh, had to go through in order to stop the disease spreading. And he has treated these rules with complete contempt. Uh, William said he didn't know what had happened. We do know that his principal private secretary, or the principal private secretary to the principal private secretary, sent a invitation to 100 people saying, come to a party this afternoon in Downing Street. That was quite contrary to the rules, which, are, which at that point said you couldn't go out of your house except go to work for the purpose of working. I'm sure the people in Downing Street had to go to work. Going to a party in the garden afterwards was not a legitimate reason. They broke the law. The Prime Minister is to be regarded as responsible for his private secretary. He will get his tone and his culture from the Prime Minister. That that was regarded as acceptable indicated he was leading the country on an entirely false basis. I think he should go. I don't think it needs an investigation. Indeed, I think it's wrong that a civil servant is investigating. I have the highest regard for Sue Gray, but she's caught in a position where her role is not to rule and a continuation of the Prime Minister. It is for the Prime Minister himself to decide whether he goes, and he shouldn't stay now in the light of the hypocrisy and lack of leadership he's shown in this moment of national crisis. But he should go. I don't think Preston Dick should go. I do think he should go. I think one should be incredibly careful about saying the Prime Minister should go because he won an election and he won an election big time in 2019. But what's happened subsequently, which had nothing to do with that election, reveals I think he's not fit for office. Whether he will go, I don't know, but I definitely think he should. I think a watershed has been reached. Janet Daly, um, welcome to the programme. We've been, been wanting to get you on for a very long time. I think the first time I saw you was on Question Time with Robin Day back in the 1980s. So you and I have both seen a lot of politics over the last 30 or 40 years. Have you ever seen something similar to this? Uh, I agree with what you said a moment ago, Ian, that, that I've never seen anything like this either. And what's so unprecedented about it is that it's not a government policy cock up uh, that he could have got a pass on that given the unprecedented nature of the situation we were in the crisis we were in the pandemic i think he would there would have been a lot of leniency about making mistakes about the policy what this seems to be is a failure of character which is indelible and unforgivable i mean the the kind of testimony that we saw if one was watching the the parliamentary debate this afternoon uh is is just typical of what we're hearing on newspapers from readers what you're hearing from people you know there are people who went through life-changing bereavements who will never ever forget the fact that they could not be with a dying parent or a dying spouse or even in some cases a dying child and who now discover that at that very moment in some cases the prime minister was having a party or attending a party in his garden which was forbidden by law laws that they had made and enacted i mean this this is quite extraordinary i think that an awful lot of leeway would have been given on the government's actions in these circumstances because nobody can remember a pandemic like this or a pandemic that has been responded to like this by by global governments um so you know if he got some things wrong in the way that he handled that that might have been forgivable but this was completely gratuitous it was unnecessary i mean 
unforced error is too trivial a, a term to use for it. There are people who will go through their lives remembering where they were at that time, <laughs> what it cost them and their families. In my own family, it was fairly trivial. We missed grandchildren's birthday parties. You know, there were family get-togethers that couldn't be had. I remember later that summer when the lockdown ended, having uh, a post-lockdown family get-together in our garden. We didn't do it on May the 20th. We did it later on in the summer when it was permitted. Um, it was the longest, I think, that my adult daughters had gone without seeing each other or seeing us. I mean, this this was an extraordinary event in most people's lives. And the uh, it does reflect either a kind of contempt or insouciance of a degree that is like 18th century aristocrats, the kind of degree that was shown for ordinary, of contempt that was shown for ordinary people. Uh, they, they disported themselves in a way that implied that they were above and beyond any kind of constraint on the very day when those constraints had been announced. It, it is quite remarkable. And I don't think that it can be forgiven. Whether he goes in the immediate, I mean, I'm dying to know what he says in question to PMQs tomorrow. That's yeah, absolute, me too. I can't wait to hear. I mean, um, it sounded today, and, it, and you know, it, 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 whenever his senior ministers have been, his <laughs> spokesmen even have been questioned about these things, they sounded like people under police interrogation who were saying no comment uh, to every question. It was outrageous. Um, so there we are. <laughs> There we are indeed. Um, Anne Longfield, what do you make of it all? Well, what a mess. Um, and so self-imposed as well. I mean, I completely agree. I've gone through the process of being shocked, hugely disappointed. I think so many feel, people feel disappointed, their trust being broken. And I don't think people will be able to not see that um, email again, just as they couldn't not hear about the um, Barnard Castle trip um, just after that. And just, also, just on that, just just on yeah. that, Anne, so, somebody was, I think it was on a tweet I saw earlier, somebody would say, well, this explains why Boris Johnson couldn't well, sack Dominic Cummings well, over Barnard Castle. I mean, I kind of clocked that and put, <laughs> it took me till about late afternoon, I've got to say, to be able to join those dots, but I came to that same conclusion. Everyone's been wondering what was going on there, and now you realise that was just part of the milieu, it was happening all the time. And and the other thing that kind of has happened, I suppose, and I've tried to process it over the last 24 hours is feeling really saddened by, you know, all the things that we've all mentioned. And there was a, a caller on your station earlier with Sheila Fogarty's programme where only one parent was able to be present when their 14-year-old daughter died. Um, and, you know, horrific, horrific um, uh, things that people went through. And I think the other thing was that you know, we should remember, we weren't just asked to do this, we were instructed. The first time in, you know, my living memory that I've been instructed in that way, and we did it. And we did it because we thought we were all in it together, we thought we were doing it for good of everyone. And 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 in the main, everyone was very, very uh, true to that. I was banging on that week about um, schools needing to reopen. You remember that? It was exactly that week. Primary school kids have been stuffed at home for weeks and weeks and there was no sign of them um at the at the time then um ever um ever returning almost um and we were told that if we went out for a walk we could sit on a park bench that's what we were told that week but we couldn't sit on it for long we had to move along because you know otherwise it wouldn't be proper exercise so it is extraordinary um i think that you know there's been some things i've seen about well people have been working hard well you know all of those people that worked in hospitals in schools elsewhere you know they worked hard and we would think we'd think they were you know it was it would be just unbelievable to think that anyone would do that so i think there has been a, a, whatever trust there was there has been uh damaged um, I think that they, there will be, uh, if it ever happens, people will take a long time to ever get any of that trust back. Will people ever listen again? And if it's true, should they ever listen again? So well, ju um, time just on tell. that, 
just on that, Charlie Faulkner, when Tony Blair was in a tough spot, he and Alastair Campbell would deploy a so-called masochism strategy where Alastair would deliberately put him up against the toughest political interviewer or a very tough audience. And Tony Blair would perform brilliantly. Um, it was mere culpa time. He would apologise. And everyone thought, oh, what a great guy to do that. Is that the sort of thing that Boris Johnson has got to do now? I don't think you should focus, Ian, on that as a method of getting out of this. Think of the substance of all of this. This is such a treachery to the people that the Prime Minister leads. Can he give an interview that gets him out of it? I doubt it. I'm not saying he will necessarily resign, because I said that depends upon what view Tory MPs take. But there is an absolute sense and... Janet referred to Mr. Jim Shannon in uh, the Commons today, who's just an example, I think, of what lots of the country is feeling, where I thought in an incredibly unshowy way, it was not at all an attempt to gain sympathy. He tried to get through it, but couldn't do it. He was describing the death of his mother-in-law alone. This degree of treachery is not something that can be dealt with with a clever interview. Most of the things that you're referring to are about, and again, this is something that Janet referred to, massive policy errors. For example, the masochism strategy to which you refer is probably by reference to the to the incredible unpopularity of the Iraq war, in which Tony again and again and again sought to defend his position in relation to Iraq. There is an incredible personal character issue engaged here. And it's, it's very, very simple. There are no complications. There is no justification. He was imposing these restrictions on us and he didn't think it applied to him because he was just couldn't be bothered and didn't have the character to give the lead the country needed. How much more do we need to know? Well, it's a 10-minute walk from Downing Street to here. If the Prime Minister wishes to bear his soul to the nation, our, our studio door will always be open. Uh, thank you very much, James, for that question. Thanks to the panel. We'll come to more of your questions in a moment. 0345 6060 973. Uh, Peter texts to say, how can they still call themselves honourable? We'll leave that as a rhetorical question, shall we? It's 18 minutes past eight. This is LBC. Question with Ian Dale on LBC. Text 84850. 
20 past eight on LBC and Longfield is with us. Chair of the Commission on Young Lives, William Clouston, leader of the SDP, uh, Lord Faulkner, Charlie Faulkner, Labour peer and former Cabinet Minister, and Janet Daly, the political columnist for the Sunday Telegraph. Uh, Camilla is in Chippenham. Hello, Camilla. Hello, Ian. Hi. Uh, Hi. My question is, are we in danger of using Boris Johnson as a scapegoat for our grief and pain in the pandemic? And the second part is, did he cause it? Just explain what you mean by using him as a scapegoat for grief. Well, there's complete uproar when we're trying to get rid of Boris Johnson and discredit him. And we seem to be forgetting all the good things that he's done like having the courage to um, order vaccines long before they were even approved and saving hundreds and hundreds of lives. Nobody even talks about that, and I think it's all very unfair. Janet Daly. I think a lot of people talked about it. There was a time I can remember when it, it this the scandal about the wallpaper erupted. And I remember writing in my column, nobody is talking about wallpaper. Everybody I talked to is talking about the vaccine program and how incredibly impressed they are with it and how grateful they are for it. That's the tragedy of this situation. He had had, if this is a horrible thing to say, a good pandemic. I mean, he'd had a very good crisis in many respects, although I think the lockdown mentality was getting out of hand. I think a lot of people were getting very impatient with it. It was re- people, it was, we were ready for it to end. And I think he's been a bit uh, reluctant to end it for the reasons that seem to me slightly sinister. Uh, but all that aside, what happened with the parties, or is it now called party gate, has kind of wiped so much of the success, his previous success. And that really is a political tragedy. Um, and so, uh, you know, I take I take the point about the successes that he had. The vaccine rollout was brilliant, and the uh, the success in controlling the pandemic in this country was brilliant. And now he's gone and done this, it's, or at least we discover that he was doing this simultaneously, which is worse, I think. So, so you think this will wipe out any credit that even Boris Johnson's sceptics might no, have given no. him over the vaccine? It won't wipe out the credit, but it's a reflection on his character that is indelible. You can't not hear it anymore. Once you've heard this, uh, it's gone into your memory in a way that is searing, particularly for those people who had terrible bereavements and terrible experiences during the lockdown, which can never, ever be rectified. Um, That's the problem. It's not that he will not be credited with the things he accomplished. It's that somehow this has told you something about him as a person, which you can never forget. And Longfield. Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, I think that people do, um, you know, we remember the things that we rose that we rose to the challenge with. Um, the vaccines were brilliant. Um, I mean, even even testing um, uh, is is something which is a norm in this country where it isn't in others. Furlough um, was, uh, you know, uh, remarkable. And then we had the Nightingale hospitals, all of those things that um, people raised uh, really um, rose to the challenge. But, you know, on the other side of the ledger, (laughs) it's mounted and mounted and mounted for people. They've had, um, uh, you know, the PP um, uh, contracts. They've had, um, you know, the um, uh, the flat um, and the um, uh, uh, de- lively decorating. Um, they've had this. They've had that. And 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 I think that you know we've we've got a prime minister that's got away with a lot that others wouldn't, you know, and hasn't explained. They just kind of um, uh, carried on. But I think you know I'm with Janet on this. I don't think you know anyone can really get beyond seeing that email. Imagine if any of us had been sent that email in our private lives we wouldn't have done if any of us in the organizations we worked in or were responsible for saw it happening you wouldn't you know that all i could think of is what is going through those people's minds that this would be allowed it was a huge risk as well why risk it well, the, the smoking gun here, Charlie Faulkner, could be that um, Martin Reynolds, the civil servant responsible for the email, could have uh, done that at the behest of Boris Johnson. But we don't know that, do we, at the moment? And that's where either Sue Gray or the Metropolitan Police have got to centre on their inquiries, presumably. They have, but he's the principal private secretary to the prime minister. The idea that he could have thought a party for 100 was OK if 
Boris Johnson didn't think that was okay is is nonsensical. It seems to me if you're in a position like that, you will follow the lead of your master, not necessarily in relation to the actual day to day, but that it is so obvious that they should never have had that party. Mm. And the idea that uh, uh, Boris Johnson's principal private secretary thought that it was okay and that Boris Johnson and his wife went indicates what the atmosphere was. And that atmosphere is awful. But just picking up on Camilla's question, Camilla's question is in effect, is the terrible suffering that so many people has gone through made people turn on Boris? I don't think for one moment that is the position. We as a country, when we go through difficult times, want to rally to our leaders. We rallied to Winston Churchill during the Second World War. The death of Princess Diana was incredibly upsetting for a lot of people. And the prime minister of the time became incredibly popular. The instincts of the public would be to trust their leader. What Janet said earlier on, he, whoever he or she was, would be forgiven for policy mistakes. But we want leadership. We want somebody who is conspicuously doing their best. And the attitude of the country will be, it's a difficult job he's doing. As long as he's trying his best, we will broadly support him. What we will not put up with is being treated with contempt and as if we are little people to whom the rules apply, whereas the rules don't apply to him because he's too important and he doesn't care about them. And it's a terrible shock that the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom turned out to be this ghastly hypocrite. Janet was thinking, when was the last time this happened? Ian, you were asking us that question. I mean, we've had Prime Ministers like Eden, who made a terrible mistake about Suez. We've had uh, Prime Ministers uh, like um, uh, uh, Major, who had a problem about Black Wednesday. When was the last time we had a massive scandal that overtook a Prime Minister? The only one I can think of is Lloyd George, who bought shares in Marconi, the electricity company, at a cheap price, then procured a huge government benefit for Marconi and watched the price go up. And he was guilty of a terrible scandal. He sort of disguised it a bit and the person was, in, was appointed to investigate it. That's the last time I can think of a scandal like this that undermines the Prime Minister to this extent. It's not happened and, in a hundred years in this country. And yet we still think of Lloyd George as one of our greatest Prime Ministers, don't we? Well, we, uh, do, think, well, we do think that his character was flawed, do we not? Well, I think this is this is interesting, isn't it? Because, um, William, I'd be interested in your view on this. Churchill had lots of previous scandals before he became Prime Minister. We had this with Lloyd George. They wouldn't stand a hope in hell in today's politics, would they? Because the scrutiny, whatever people think of political journalists in this country, the scrutiny that politicians are put under nowadays is far superior to anything that went before. Yeah, I'd probably agree with that. I think Charlie has a little bit of a... A memory problem. The last prime minister that made a terrible error was Blair over Iraq, right? That, that okay. wasn't a scandal. But, well, well I mean, you can, you can describe it as a scandal if you like, but it, I, it's I, not I not in this it sense. A scandal because, Ian, because six hundred fifty thousand people lost their lives as a result. So I will do if I want. Um, on the question of whether we're making uh, the prime minister a scapegoat, uh, I don't think we are. Uh, I think all that's happening is he's making his own mistakes. He's making a series of mistakes and it's getting worse. But actually, to go back to what Charlie Faulkner said earlier about characters in politics and making your own room for, for uh, making your own rules, as it were, I mean, we, there's been precedent. I mean, I actually, George Brown is a good example of that from the 60s. Probably the most popular Labour politician of the 60s. Uh, certainly the, the, the public loved him. Uh, you know, and he, he, he appeared... Uh, inebriated on television and got away with it for a long time but the, th the fact is at the end of this you end up in the gutter you know and that's what happened to him and 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 and, and boris johnson again if you look at his 
uh, school reports and accounts of him at school. He never thought the rules were very important, never really obeyed them. Now, you know, that did, he got away with it for a long time, but it is wearing thin. On the question about the pandemic, the final question, um, I, don't think the, I don't think a fair-minded person could say that the UK government has done significantly worse than many other major countries. Not significantly worse than the United States or France, or Italy. Italy's excess death rate per million is, is slightly higher than ours. There are about five or six or seven, I think, uh, European countries with higher death rates. I think we did very, very, I think we were unlucky at the start because we were seeded from three or four different places simultaneously, Italy, uh, France and Spain. So I had a very bad start, but the vaccine program was, was exceptional and the, and the government should get credit for that. And, and, you know, I think the sad thing about the pandemic actually is that Giesecke and some of the Swedish, uh, uh, you know, experts actually said at the start, it's as long as it's short. And, and in the end, when, when the sort of excess deaths and the academic work's done in about five or six years' time, you'll find that most jurisdictions, uh, most modern Western countries that are open are going to do pretty much, uh, you know, as well or as badly as, as the others. OK, thank you very much and thanks to Camilla for her question. More to come, 0345 6060 973. It's 8.31, news time on LBC with Simon English. The leader of the Scottish Conservatives says if Boris Johnson attended a garden party at Downing Street during the first lockdown, he should resign. Douglas Ross is urging the PM to answer questions about it now rather than waiting for an internal investigation. A man who was looking at adult dating sites on his phone before a crash which killed three people has been jailed for nearly nine years. Ian Onert, who's 41 and from the Scottish borders, had been browsing profiles and editing his own before hitting traffic at nearly 60 miles an hour. The vicar of Dibley Star Gary Waldhorn has died at the age of 78. He was best known for playing councillor David Horton in every episode of the comedy and also performed with the Royal Shakespeare Company. LBC weather, light rain clearing the southeast, leaving it mostly dry and clear tonight. Some fog and frost as temperatures dip to one degree in places. A bit milder further north. Tomorrow's looking mostly dry and bright with plenty of sunshine and highs of nine degrees. This is LBC.
Boss Question with Ian Dale on LBC. Call 0345 6060 973. 8.35 on LBC. It's Tuesday's Cross Question. Uh, with me, Anne Longfield, the Chair of the Commission on Young Lives, William Clouston, Leader of the SDP, uh, Lord Faulkner, Labour Peer and former Cabinet Minister, and Janet Daly, political columnist for the Sunday Telegraph. Uh, next call, well, in fact, it's a text from Munesh in Southall, who says the country is falling apart due to the Prime Minister. How can the opposition do something about it? And why aren't they doing more? Um, Charlie Faulkner, what more could they do? Well, I think they've got to make a decision about whether or not they should call for uh, the Prime Minister's resignation. I do think that uh, you should do that very rarely as the opposition, for the reasons I gave earlier on, which is you've won an election, and actually this Prime Minister's won an election uh, with a majority of 80 in December uh, 2019. But I think a point is reached where confidence has gone in the Prime Minister. It's not really a question of having a vote of no confidence, because that'd be bound to be won. But the argument should now be made that the character of the Prime Minister is such that he's no longer fit to be Prime Minister, as revealed by the events that have occurred since he became Prime Minister, since he won the election in December 19. And that, above all, is what we should now be doing. We should be prosecuting a case against the Prime Minister, the things that have been done, and we should be as hard as we can be in relation to this, because there is no but complication did, in relation to this. Did the electorate not vote for Boris Johnson knowing what he was like? They knew in general terms what he was like. They could have had no conception that he would treat the people he leads with such contempt, that he should demand these restrictions with the personal suffering that Anne and Janet described in the various examples they gave, and he was going to treat those as nothing as far as he was concerned they did not think that was what they were voting for how could they have possibly envisaged that that would be the position now, every single call that we're getting in this hour is on this subject, and that's fine, and I'm perfectly happy to go through the whole hour taking calls on this subject, but if you do want to phone in on anything else, you're very welcome to as well, 0345 6060 973. Uh, Anne Longfield. Well, I think the fact that all the calls are on this says something, doesn't it? I mean, it is what yeah. everyone is talking about, and it is something which people feel very personally to them. Um, you know, just on the last caller again, are people just taking it out on uh, the Prime Minister? No, I think it's people's experience and the difficulties they had, which means it hurts so much. And I think for a lot of people, it, it is about hurting that trust. Um, what should be done? What should the opposition be doing about this? Well, I think tomorrow is going to be pivotal because we've got um, uh, Prime Minister's questions and they have to be piercing and they have to be uh, solid and they have to be asking the question the nation wants um, answering. Um, I noticed today uh, Ed Miliband was talking about stage at a time, step by step, and that's probably right. Uh, there will be a point, I think, over the next few days, if not hours, when we get to Charlie's point where actually there has to be the call for the Prime Minister to step down um, through Oh, some uh, some sense of decency, if nothing else, in my view. Um, and then processes in whatever stage they will be will take their course. But I think what we have to see here is this can't become the norm. This can't just slip back. There's this sense that, you know, these, you know, we reach these crescendos a number of times and then, you know, things move on. Maybe it's the interviewing that you're talking about, you know, something happens and, you know, we all get distracted. There's a new kind of crisis somewhere. But actually, there is something here, I think, that people want this to mean something and they want there to be consequences. And that's something I think will unfold over coming days. William. Um, I mean, the question is what what the government, what the opposition can do. I mean, the opposition can't do a great deal. I mean, um, they can oppose. Most of the reason for the Conservatives' fall in the polls is is just self destruction. I mean, it's not because Starmer's particularly good. Starmer leads a, a party that can't win a general election for electoral dynamics reasons. A lot of people that hasn't sunk into a lot of people. They've lost Scotland. They've lost the Red Wall. I mean, they could fight a a stalemate. To the red wall in the next election or even get some seats but there's still be a long way 
behind. So, so, they are... so why 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 would you be wanting to split the vote then? Um, because you're an opposition party, you can't win an election. So why sh why don't the opposition parties combine? Well, because they have value divides and different views on things. I mean, the, the problem is, Ian, that the Labour Party, as I say, is just a big version of the Liberal Democrats. Uh, there are Liberals everywhere. If you want a proper uh, you know, party of the patriotic left, you have to build it, which is what we're doing, uh, to give people uh, an alternative. You're, you're, not, you're not a left of centre party. You just don't read our stuff, Ian. You said that before. You want to, I, you I read enough to know that you're, no, you're you actually surreptitiously trying to appeal to right of centre voters. We do. Aren't, we're culturally conservative. That's true. And I would say exactly. we're more culturally conservative than the Tories, which isn't difficult. But on the economic programme, we've put a, a, um, a, a green paper out, which you should read the end of indifference. On the economy and on industrial strategy, on trade policy and so on, very much to the left. In fact, I would say... New Labour basically didn't do any of the basics in there when they had the opportunity on housing or uh, look at look at uh, railway nationalisation or utilities did absolutely nothing. So that's where the sweet spot is, uh, which is why we're building it. But the broader picture is we're just not well governed. The, 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 everyone knows the public has a rotten choice between these establishment parties, which is why it's rational. I know it'll take time, but to build something better. Janet Daly. I want to disagree with Charlie um, about the advice to the Labour Party, and I mean this sincerely, even though I am a Conservative commentator, I'm genuine in my advice here. If they do what he wants them to do, they'll be overplaying their hand. And really, the Tories are doing quite enough to discredit themselves without Labour looking as if it's playing political games and trying to cash in on it. And I'm afraid that Labour has rather painted itself into a corner on pandemic policy. They have consistently demanded more lockdown, more strict measures, more strict restrictions. And the country is fed up with that now. That is not the public mood. They have got to get themselves out of that corner. And I say this really frankly, Charlie, that that is the advice I would give to Labour. Stop going on about wanting ever stricter lockdowns and ever longer lockdowns. That is not what the people want at the moment. Offer constructive solutions for where we are now and don't overplay your hand when the government is sort of flat on its back anyway you don't have to add to that they're doing it enough on their own i think charlie think that's interesting what janet has said uh, there are two separate points there first of all have we been too keen on restrictions i don't think we have for example we've not been pressing the government to go into lockdown in the face of Omicron, we broadly agreed with the position. Well, you, you have in Wales, think, to be fair. That's true in Wales, but not in England. And I think Janet is wrong to say that from time to time we've said they've been too slow. And I think they have been too slow in various things. I mean, everybody will remember Christmas of last year, not Christmas 2021, but Christmas 2020, when they were in a complete shambles about a whole range of things. If you remember, the schools were opened, closed, opened, then closed, all on the same day. That was not a government with a grip. And an opposition should be calling a government out that is that chaotic. But on the second point, which is the key point I think that Janet was making, don't call for the Prime Minister to resign as a tactical matter, is what <laughs> Janet is saying. Let events engulf the Prime Minister and your tactical view, Janet, might be right. But there comes a point when the purpose of the opposition must be to call out the inadequacies of the Prime Minister when he is this inadequate as a leader of the country. So maybe your political acumen is better than mine. But in terms of where the opposition should stand on the way this Prime Minister has behaved, is they should say he is no longer fit to be Prime Minister. David Davis always used to say on uh, oppositions calling for resignations, only do it when you think that there's more than a 50% chance of it actually happening, because then you can claim some credit for it. And he, he did have a few, I think, was it two home secretaries he got, got rid yeah, of? He was, he was very good at that. But, I mean, isn't, doesn't there come a point? And we've, I mean, I, I'm, I'm stunned, in a way, by Janet, who has probably of all four of us, given the most effective. And I thought, <laughs> if I were Boris Johnson listening to what Janet Daly, a conservative, and I don't say that in an insulting way, 
columnist had said, I'd have felt terrible because it was so telling and so accurate. And then having what? described this moral degenerate who is not fit to be prime minister, she said there was an indelible stain on his character that would never <laughs> be forgotten. Don't call for his resignation. No, 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 no. I was giving, I must admit, fairly cynical, hard-headed, tactical... Yeah, it was not, it was not, it was not a morally gigantic piece of advice. <laughs> <laughs> Well, um, you now know why we wanted Janet on the programme, so um, thank you very much indeed for all of that. Uh, more of your calls in just a moment. Uh, 0345 6060 It's quarter to nine. LBC, Nick Ferrari at breakfast. Weekday mornings from seven. It would appear life is just one big party at number 10. Labour MP and Shadow Climate Net Zero Secretary Ed Miliband joins me. How damaged is the Prime Minister? He's got to tell us, did he go to the party? How can he possibly justify it? How can he justify his statements in the House of Commons that he broke no rules, that all the rules were followed, that nothing untoward happened in his building? He can't hide behind this inquiry though. If I went to a party, Nick, I know whether I went to the party or not. I don't need Sue Gray to tell me whether I went to the party. Nick Ferrari at breakfast. Back tomorrow morning from 7. Listen on your radio and on Global Player. LBC. You're a Cross Question with Ian Dale on LBC. It's 8.49 on LBC. Um, I'm going to ask my panel to be relatively concise in their answers on the next question so we can fit in one that actually isn't on the same issue. But first, Julie's in Hammersmith. Hello, Julie. Hello. Uh, Hi. Yes, I'd like to broaden the discussion a little bit and ask the panel to what extent they think that faith in politicians and democracy generally has been diminished by the current shenanigans. I don't think Charlie Faulkner will remember, but I was secretary to the ministerial board that he established in the Ministry of Justice, and I worked in that department for my entire career. So I saw a succession of ministers pass through, and I always thought that all of them, whether they were Conservative or Labour, were concerned to do the best for the country. 
And this government in particular, and in particular its leader, appear to have destroyed any level of trust in all politicians in a relatively short time. And I'd be interested in their views on that. Well, I'm going to give Charlie a few minutes to work out whether he does remember you, Julie, um, and Longfield first. Well, I certainly think that the um, uh, trust in this government um, it has been uh, broken. And I guess more broadly than that, um, politicians and politics more generally becomes tarnished, which isn't a good thing. Um, I think that, you know, we were just having the discussion then about tactics and when we call for um, or when when the opposition call for um, the PM to go and the like. And of course, you know, this is an important moment. It's not just about tactics. It's about um, everything around the uh, character, but also uh, the strength of the government. But I think for, for everyday people, you know, there's an awful lot that they want governments to do. Governments aren't just about being in power and the process of the thing. Governments are there to do things. And there's things that people want help with cost of living coming over the top um, in terms of crisis. Um, They want their kids in school. They want their jobs. They want levelling up. You know, these things that they want government to do. And whilst clearly, you know, there's a lot of unease, real doubts here, um, uh, I think in the long term, whatever government that is, people want stuff done. And this is a distraction. And people deserve better than a prime minister who will chance that away. I do think there is something of a lack of a valve here, which under, you know stops this happening. Um, and uh, again, I've got to say, Janet put a finger on it in terms of the character and the character flaw there. And uh, the question is whether... Um, the country can put up with that. Um, but I do think there's a question here uh, to, to, you know, really ensure that we get the, pr- the politics that people deserve. And I think that's better. Janet Taylor. This issue of cynicism about politics and politicians is a very interesting question, because when you ask people whether they trust politicians or whether they trust the government, they almost always say no. <clears throat> whatever the opinion polling question is. But when you ask them about their particular MP, as often as not, they say they like them, they trust them, they've been helpful, they've been kind, they've gone out of their way to help them. So uh, there's a real discrepancy there between the, the image of politics in general and the image of legislators and MPs in particular. And I think an awful lot of the way people vote and their loyalty in politics depends on the quality of MPs. And the quality of MPs, I have to tell you, coming from another country, the quality of MPs in their character in this country is very high. And the conscientiousness of those MPs is very high, especially considering that in many cases, the earnings, their, their, in, their income as an MP is not as high as they might have got if they were in private life, in private business. Um, so I think that uh, it's a mistake to think that a government doing something stupid, uh, which they all do. I mean, this was exceptionally stupid and 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 callous. Um, necessarily reflects on faith in the democratic institutions and in Parliament itself. William, um, I I think I think the potential corrosive effect of this on on, on sort of public trust is 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 very important. But if you look at the survey data, um, I don't think. I don't think respect for politics has really recovered from from the sort of cash, cash for questions issues, you know, in the latter part of the major government on the data, um, which was odd because actually major's government wasn't particularly corrupt by any standards. I mean, anyone that knew Labour uh, municipal authorities would, 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 was laughing laughing at that at the time. But so I think we need to be careful. I think most people go into politics for good reasons. Uh, but like the public, you know, hu- human beings are, are flawed, you know, so I think less cynicism would be better. I think uh, some of when when politicians just completely change their view on something, I think the public can see through it and, and don't respect it. So I think we need to have a little bit more belief, possibly, in politics. Charlie, do you remember Julie? Julie, were you the secretary of the National Criminal Justice Board? No, I was secretary to the ministerial board when you had Cathy Ashton, Bridget Prentice and Harriet Harman as ministers. Ah, oh, the, 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 the ministerial board of the Ministry of Justice? Okay. Ah, yes, no, Julie, I do remember you. Uh, <laughs> thank you for asking What, co- what, what colour also... hair has she got? 
I, I can't remember what colour hair she's got, but I do remember her being Never the secretary. Mind. <laughs> the, right, to the question, Charlie. Uh, I, I also agree strongly with Julie that my experience of ministers, Tory or Labour, is that they are trying to do their best by the country. The question was, is this going to undermine trust in politicians generally, what Boris Johnson has done? Answer, yes, it will do. I think, I don't think actually uh, the cash for questions in um, the major government was what undermined trust in um, politicians. It was much more the expenses scandal and possibly the Iraq war and the consequences of that that have had an impact on people's trust in politicians fairly or unfairly. I think probably unfairly. This series of events about the party and the prime minister, and we discussed earlier the fact that it's 100 years since a prime minister has engaged in wrongdoing of this sort, not a mistake on policy, but something that is so awful in terms of degeneracy. I think that will have an impact that will affect all okay. politicians. It will mean that it's very difficult to trust us. Um, final comment on this comes from an anonymous texter. The only honest politicians are Corbyn and his supporters. The rest are scum. Well, there's always one, isn't there? Now, I don't know how you are on your French politics, but that's the subject of our text question from Philippa in Dagenham. It's not long until the French election. Would, the, would Emmanuel, Emmanuel Macron losing the presidency be a loss or a bonus for the UK? 45 seconds each, if we can. William? Um, probably if Pécresse wins, probably again. Actually, I think Macron's type of politics, sort of liberal, globalist stuff, is just is is gone. So probably again if Pécresse wins. But um, there you go, Charlie. It'd be a great loss if one of the politicians on the far right won. It would cause huge difficulties, I believe, for the United Kingdom and indeed for the world. As to whether it, if 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 it was the centre-right, or I'm not sure where Macron would now put himself, centre-right, centre, centre-left, I don't think it will make that much difference to which of the two it is. Janet? I don't think there's any happy outcome in the French political scene for Britain. Uh, I think the, the, the virtually the entire French political establishment is so furious about Brexit that they will be vindictive uh, and vengeful about it. Uh, by necessity, whoever gets in, and they have got a really serious Eurosceptic problem within France. A great many people that I'm in touch with in France say that there is huge Euroscepticism in France. And whoever becomes, whoever succeeds Macron, if anyone does indeed succeed him, will have to cope with that. Well said. Uh, Anne? Well, I think it'd be a loss because actually the pandemic has um, got in the way of what could have been, and I'm being an optimist here, a next phase in relationships. So on the basis of continuity, I'd say it was a loss. But um, clearly there's a lot to build on there. There's a lot to, that needs building. And you've been all admirably brief, so we can fit in our final, uh, for what we call a fun text question, which fills people with absolute horror. It's from Doreen in Hull. For the Queen's Platinum Jubilee this year, there's a pudding competition. The best recipe gets shown to the Queen herself. I wonder if she has to taste it. What desserts would the panel submit? Um, Charlie, are you a cook? Not a cook, but without doubt, the recipe I would submit would be banoffee pie, which is Oof. my favourite pudding. It was invented quite recently. I'm quite sure that one could doll it up a bit, but that would be my very humble pudding place before <laughs> Her Majesty the Queen. William? Uh, it would be a sort of pear uh, and raspberry flan uh, that we make. Uh, we have one pear tree and some raspberries and we and actually I pick them my wife makes it but it's brilliant Anne well I think we need to get back onto queen of puddings because it's all the good things custard jam and meringues floating along along the top to make us all feel optimistic about the future so yeah queen of puddings for me and Janet I'm a half-hearted republican <laughs> so I will say eaten mess 
Good I think you, you can't beat my mum's jam roller kit, but there we go. Uh, thank you very much for joining us. Anne Longfield, William Clouston, Janet Daly and Charlie Faulkner. We'll be back with Cross Question again tomorrow at 8 o'clock on LBC. We're going to continue the conversation about the consequences of the, da the Downing Street Garden Party. Is there a way back for Boris Johnson? What do you think he should say at PMQs tomorrow? 66% um, of the British public, according to Savanta Comres, think he should resign. That's 12% more than after the other Downing Street party back in December. Do you think he's toast? It's nine o'clock. On your radio, on Global Player and... Play LBC. Leading Britain's conversation. This is LBC. From Global's newsroom at nine o'clock, two new opinion polls suggest a majority of the public think Boris Johnson should resign as pressure grows on him to say whether he was at a drinks party in Downing Street during lockdown. An email was sent to about 100 people inviting them to bring their own booze to a gathering in May 2020. The SNP leader in Westminster, Ian Blackford, tells LBC the Prime Minister's time 